Okay, so what I want to do is reiterate um, both how the nominating committee of a board of directors operates, as well as the elections for these uh, board of uh, board of director members uh, elections by shareholders. Okay, so let me just kind of go over what I've already gone over in class. We get nominations into the nominating committee. Who makes these nominations? It could be shareholders who own a certain minimum threshold of stock. $2,000 worth of stock is very common, so we can just, I'll just say that from now on. So if you own $2,000 worth of stock, you can nominate people uh, for the board of directors. And by the way, that means that really many, many people within the firm, managers, board members, they also own that much stock. So they, they also meet that threshold. Some boards have it to where the current board is automatically nominated unless the board member says, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to be on there. So there are a number of ways that we get nominations into the nominating committee. And the nominating committee is, is therefore going to be a big gatekeeper and they have a lot of power within the firm. Let me clarify that. They have a lot of power within the management of that one firm. So not necessarily power outside that firm, they may or may not, uh, but within the firm they have a lot of power because they're, they are the board and they're determining who gets to go onto the uh, ballot for the next board. Okay, so there's a lot of power uh, in this nominating committee and in the board in general. So we have nominations that go to the nominating committee. The nominating committee takes all the nominations and then recommends the ones that they want the full board to vote on. Okay, and this is what we went over in class. So for example, the nominating committee may get uh, uh, 30 nominations, right, from shareholders and we saw some of the kind of the crazy shareholder proposals. So they might be people who are completely unqualified. They also may be people who the board doesn't necessarily think they should be there. So it could be an activist investor, someone who has a lot of experience, someone who may appear uh, like they can sit on a board, but the board themselves, they don't necessarily want this person on the board because that person may obviously disrupt uh, what, you know, what, what the board's agenda is. So just imagine we have 30 uh, people come in. The nominating committee's uh, role is to vet these people and then to send uh, whatever number it is to the full board. So the full board does vote for whoever goes on the ballot. So again, I'm just using examples. Let's say we have 30 people that go in, okay? But then like, let's say that there are 13 people who sit on the board, and so there's 13 people who come out. The key here is that the 17 rejects are not necessarily ever given a second chance, and this is where power lies in the nominating committee. It's not necessarily that they have, they do have the power certainly to, for, with these 13, but, it, but these 13 have to go in front of the full board. So there is going to be another process by which these 13 have to be vetted, okay? It's these 17 rejects who never really, uh, rejects is not a nice term, I mean people who have been rejected by the nominating committee, it's these 17 rejects who, uh, who really are, they succumb to the power of the nominating committee. They just don't have any other choices. These 13, or whatever the number is, goes to the full board. The full board votes. It's usually a majority vote, so and they normally rubber stamp this. They normally rubber stamp it because part of the board were the ones who nominated them, and the board, having limited time, having bounded rationality, having bounded time, don't necessarily have all the time in the world to fight the nominating committee, nor do they want to. Okay? So these are going to be rubber stamped usually. They select the list. The full board approves the list for the shareholder vote. Okay. Now the second half of the board is the actual election. This is going to be the election for the board members by the shareholders. And um, the first one is an uncontested election. So in an uncontested election, uh, we're basically, uh, I didn't even put anything over here. In an uncontested election, we have a slate of nominees, who, which equals the number of board seats. Okay. So I just have X equals the number of board seats. I don't want to keep using 13 because I don't want you to, to believe that 13 is the number. So we have X number of board seats. In an uncontested election, there are X number of nominees. They are then voted on by the shareholders, and it's for or against. Now remember, they need a majority for, but it's only the votes that actually vote. So if someone, if a shareholder throws their proxy statement in the trash, then that doesn't count. So it's not a majority of all shareholders. It's a majority of all represented shareholders, either at the annual meeting 
or through proxy, uh, and, and we need a majority there. Now, in an uncontested election, there are two ways normally that this is done. One is that a vote, f uh, a vote for is obviously a vote for, and a vote against uh, is going to be a vote against, but an, an abstention. So if I just simply don't vote for that board seat, or maybe I'm, I'm voting for other things but not the board, uh, that counts as a vote against. That's a little stricter than the second way, which is that if I abstain my vote, it just simply doesn't count. And that doesn't go for the against votes. Okay? All you need to really understand is that in, in an uncontested election, 98%, uh, I don't know what the number is, 98% of the time, almost all the time, uh, these board members are just simply voted in. Okay? You also should understand that uncontested elections are by far by, by far, 90-something percent, the majority of the time we see uncontested elections uh, for board members. Now, in a contested election, there are going to be two ways that we can have a contested election. Um, one is a slate versus slate. You'll sometimes see this uh, when, when an activist shareholder has a lot of power and gets the, their way with the current nominating committee and the current board. And they say, look, we don't like your entire board because they've made p poor decisions in the past. And so we want an entirely uh, new set of members to come on. And you'll see a slate versus slate. I'll give you an example in a project that we're going to do in a couple weeks where you'll see this, uh, air products and air gas. Okay? And so it's basically either this slate or this slate is going to win. You vote on an entire grouping of members. So it's not like I pick one from this slate and one from this slate. It's these X number, 13, 11, whatever it is, or this X number. And then that slate becomes the board. Very uncommon. The other one is just having excess candidates greater than X. So whatever the number of board seats there are, we have more candidates. And those who, you know, those who get the votes up to the number X are the ones voted in. So again, if X is 13, we need 13 board seats, and there's 17 people on the ballot, then the four who get the least number of votes just don't get to be on the board. Very uncommon. These are very uncommon uh, in contested elections. Now, the role of activist shareholders in terms of the power to get some of these things through or get other board seats added uh, is sometimes immense. An activist shareholder could have 1%, 3%, 10% of the firm, and their goal is to shake up management and the board because they think that prior actions of management and the board uh, were lazy or inefficient or non-optimal or whatever you want to say. So people like Carl Icahn and Robert Ackman, and we know these people now, um, will come in. And if they have a lot of power, uh, they may say, well, we want to expand the board. So uh, we're going to fight you on proposals at the annual meeting unless you come to the negotiation table and increase the board from X to X plus 2. And we want those two board seats right now. Okay? And then in the next election, those two people will have to go up for an actual election with shareholders. So you'll remember from the Dell document, and if you look at any other documents, the board almost always has the right to uh, create new board seats between annual shareholder meetings. And if they do that, they simply just get to pick those board members. Now, since we have elections every year and not every three years like we used to, that's not necessarily all that controversial. Okay? But you will read articles sometimes where you'll see an activist investor has so much power that that activist investor gets the nominating committee to actually put people onto uh, this list for, for the full board to vote on and then potentially also uh, to, to the ballot. That does happen. It is very rare, and it, it seems less rare because those stories are, are very interesting. And so they hit the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and all these other publications. You might think that activist investors are all over the place. They're very, activist investors are very common, but their wins are, in my sense, in my opinion, exaggerated in the media. A lot of times these investors don't have as much power as we might think they do. We only see the stories where the power actually won. They're the stories that are interesting, therefore they're the stories that get into the Wall Street Journal or Bloomberg.com or whatever it might be. Okay? So this is basically the nominating committee, how we nominate people to the, to, to, to the board or to the, to the ballot. And then at the shareholder meeting, at the annual meeting, this is basically how we're going to elect those people. Now, uh, one other uh, one other thing that we know 
is that some people in the corporation own lots of stock. They obviously have lots of power. If this is not like a political election, so if I have 10 times more stock than you, I have 10 times more power than you. That's number one. Number two, we know because of our readings that some people hold special classes of shares that have exponential power. So Mark Zuckerberg, his shares in Facebook have a two to one voting power. He owns 27% of the corporation, but has 54% of the voting power because of these management shares. Uh, this could be 10 to one. So this could be, uh, I think Hires Root Beer was one where the management had 10 to one voting share. So uh, one thing is that some people are disproportionate owners. Another is they have disproportionate shares, meaning they have lots of power vested in fewer shares. Okay. Uh, and, and in a separate video, I'm going to explain what cumulative voting is, because cumulative voting also sways how we see these shareholder elections. Uh, but I'll save that for, uh, for another video.